Memoirs of a Dad, narrated by Mark Carroll. Chapter 3 I began the previous chapter by saying 1985 was not a good year for me. We ended that chapter at Easter, when we were camping at Nether Olibrook Farm. So, we might as well begin where we left off. Next to the farm lies a tiny hamlet by the name of Olibrook Booth, comprising a few cottages one of which was occupied by three children and their mother, Rosie. Tom soon made friends with Rosie's children. If my memory serves me correct, Anna, the eldest, was two or three years older than Tom. Matthew was about the same age, and Erica was the youngest. As a result of this friendship, Edale became quite a favourite spot of Tom's. However, let me digress for a moment. There are a number of farming hamlets scattered along the lower slopes of the Edale Valley, the main centre being Grindsbrook Booth, which most offcomers call Edale Village, presumably because Edale Railway Station is located close by. In addition to the four named, others included are Upper Booth, Barber Booth and Nether Booth. The word booth for a settlement is not that common in England, in fact, it is of Scandinavian origin, both Norse and Danish, and can denote a temporary dwelling, a summer pasture, or simply a dwelling. In the case of Edale, it is associated with sheep farming. Having imparted that tidbit of information, we can return to our narrative. All good things come to an end, and the Easter holiday of 1985 was no exception. We returned to Manchester, and I went back to work during the day, and Tom went back to being looked after by Joan Chandler and her children, Amy and Danny, until I picked him up after closing the shop in the evening. The tandem, minus Kitty Krantz, was picked up by its new owners, and I began to make plans to build another for Tom and myself. Trading conditions continued to deteriorate. The five-star rally dealer on Dickinson Road in Longsight closed down, and a new shop, also on Dickinson Road, but at the other end in Rushholm, opened up. The Bicycle Doctors, a workers' cooperative. It flourishes to this day. I was finding it increasingly difficult to pay the rent for the shop. Sooner or later, something had to give, but the more obvious that became, the more stubborn was my response. I became increasingly determined to carry on. I wasn't going to be beat by Thatcherism. The wicked witch of the south, as Tom by then called her, couldn't reign forever, or could she? The Tories were gradually losing their seats in the north of England, and in Scotland. They'd never had much influence in Wales. Conquered nations have long memories. But in the south of England, it was a different story, particularly in the non-industrial areas. The country was increasingly becoming divided, both politically and economically. The gap between rich and poor widened and deepened as the establishment systematically began to destroy the post-war political consensus, no longer committed to a mixed economy or the welfare state. Thatcher proclaimed there was no such thing as society, merely families, and the only desirable family structures were nuclear. Sundays became increasingly precious, and our rides out became more and more important to me. They were the few hours left, when life became simple and hopeful once again. Mother Nature, rain, hail or shine, always worked her magic, and Tom continued to make me smile, and give me the will and inspiration to carry on. He was the rock around which my life revolved. By the autumn, my friends began to notice the negative changes in me, and eventually I was descended upon by a good mate, Mick Murray, who was then teaching and living in Sheffield. You need a holiday, he informed me, and we are going camping in Dentdale in the Yorkshire Dales National Park next weekend. You and Tom are coming with us. I protested. I needed to look after the shop. Mick wasn't having it. Get somebody to look after it for you. In the end, I agreed, providing we could take the newly built tandem 
and I could get somebody to look after the shop. A friend who occasionally helped out as a bike mechanic agreed to look after the business, so off we went. Dentdale is a beautiful place. Imagine a long narrow valley with high hills on either side and a river, namely the Dee, running throughout its length. It runs east to west, close to the geological divide between the volcanic rocks of the Lake District and the limestone of northwest Yorkshire. It is about ten miles in length, roughly the same length as the city of Manchester along its longest axis, but it only has a population of just over 700 souls. These live in scattered farmsteads and tiny hamlets, the three main settlements being Cowgill at the eastern end, Dent at its centre, and the small settlement of Garthrop, a mile or so to the west of Dent and high up on the valley side. The road and lane system in the valley takes the form of a figure of eight, with Dent at its centre, ideal for cyclists of all degrees of experience. The nearest town is Sebba, sheltering under the impressive Owgills at the western end of the dale, and separated from it by the River Rothy, a tributary of the River Loon, into which the Dee flows. In short, it is an ideal touring centre for cyclists and walkers alike. We pitched our tents in an idyllic spot near the river on the edge of Calgo. Everything was perfect, except that everything is never perfect. It was raining when we arrived. No great problem that. Both tents were high-quality mountain tents. There was a good pub nearby, namely the sportsman. Tom and I were well equipped for wet weather cycling, and there were plenty of places in the valley to obtain both refreshment and shelter. We travelled up on the Friday night. It was raining when we awoke in the morning, and it was raining when we went to sleep. The story was repeated on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. It never stopped. By Tuesday evening... Mick and his then-partner, Janice, were obviously unhappy. They were walkers, and thus obtaining shelter was not as easy for them as it was for Tom and me. If it's raining in the morning, we're going back to Sheffield. We can finish the holiday in the Peak District. I agreed, and Tom didn't vote against. However, I insisted we return via Manchester. I wanted to call in the shop and make sure everything was OK. It was raining in the morning, and we soon packed our tents before having lunch at the sportsman. The journey back went well. By the time we were in Lancashire, the sun came out. We took our time, and by the time we arrived at the shop, it was dusk. The shop lights shone brightly. We had customers. We parked the car, and I got out. A good customer and friend, Vim by name, stood in the doorway. A lecturer in chemistry at Manchester University, he stood six foot seven in his socks. I built him a mate to measure tandem, a twenty-six and a half inch frame at the front, twenty-two inch at the rear, as well as a solo bike. I greeted him and then realised something. The shop window was empty. Vin didn't look happy. The shop had been stripped. Landlord's bailiffs, Vince explained, they've taken everything except for your tools and frame-building equipment. They're all safe. They're in my garage at home. What about Felix Schmidt's tandem? He came just as the bailiffs arrived. Stuart held the door open for him and he rolled it out before they could stop him. He'll pay you for it when you make contact. I nodded. I felt numb. Eventually, Vin said, There's nothing you can do now. I'll sort out things here and lock up. Get on with your holiday. I returned to the car, and we drove to Sheffield. I can't remember anything after that until later that evening, when I put Tom to bed. Mick insisted we went down to his local. I began to liven up shortly after we arrived there. As we commenced the third pint, he shook his head and said, You're a rum bugger. You've just lost your business and your livelihood. You're facing bankruptcy, and yet you've got a grin on your face. You're laughing and joking. It doesn't make sense. It's simple, I replied. I've been knocking my head against a brick wall for three long years, and some kind person has just demolished the bloody wall. 
Right, he retorted. Well, now that's sorted, we can get on with our holiday. I'm getting dry, and it's your round. I went to the bar. Life was getting interesting once again. In fact, I felt quite liberated. Bankruptcy had no fear for me. After all, it was a piece of legislation designed by capitalists to get capitalists off the hoop when their speculations went wrong. And I was a capitalist, albeit one whose capital only consisted of the tools of his trade, the bulk of which were only files, drills and other simple hand tools, along with the frame-building jigs I designed and made myself. Most important of all, under the law, nobody could take my tools off me. My capital, at least, was safe. I could continue frame-building, providing I could find premises. Tom would not go hungry and would still be clothed. The family home was in danger, but we still had the tent and the tandem. What else could anybody need? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Learn to whistle and sing. <laughs>